Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second event of the Just Street Safe and Equitable Mobility in our community series. This series is co-sponsored by the Kerwin Institute on Race and Ethnicity. Today's guest, Jesse Singer, will explain historic and modern racial and economic disparities in traffic fatalities and how the death toll is fueled by policy and infrastructure that puts the most vulnerable in harm's way. My name is Jerica Logan, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator at the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis, otherwise known as CURA. I will be your host for this event. If you require closed captioning, you will find a box at the bottom of the screen called CC. Click on the box and select Show Subtitles. This will allow you to see subtitles during the presentation. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar in the Q&A box. We will ask as many of your questions as we can in the last portion of the presentation. And if we do not get to your question, we do apologize. If you have any questions following this event, please feel free to email me at kira at osu.edu. This event is approved for one AICP CM. To claim your CM credits, log into your My APA account on the APA website and enter the event log into your online CM event log. There will also be a brief survey at the end of the webinar, and if you have time, please provide your feedback. I am now going to pass it over to our director, Harvey Miller. Yes, hi everyone and welcome to uh, the second event this semester in our series on Just Street, Safe and Equitable uh, Mobility in our Communities. Uh, we, have, we have two more events coming up later this semester. You don't want to miss that. Uh, on November 17th at noon at Eastern Standard Time, we'll have uh, Jesus Barras and he will talk about safe for, for whom? Mobility, justice, and biking where black when black in the context of traffic safety and enforcement. Uh, Jesus is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at the University of California, Davis. And then on December 1st, we'll have Veronica Davis, the Director of Transportation and Drainage Operations for Houston Public Works, longtime transportation planning professional and advocate, and author of the most of a recent book, Inclusive Transportation, a Manifesto for Repairing Divided Communities. So again, November 17th and December 1st. To learn more about our events, go to our webpage and sign up for our monthly newsletter at cura.osu.edu. You can also like Cura on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So today's speaker, Jessica Singer. Jessica is a journalist and author of There Are No Accidents, The Deadly Rise of Injury and Disaster, Who Profits and Who Pays the Price. This was named by Slate Magazine, Fortune Magazine, Mother Jones, as and The Economist as a best book of for the year 19 or 19 for the year 2022. And I also would add that it's one of was one of my favorite books for the year 2022. It's a very good book and a book that I've been recommending very widely for people who are interested in um, the, the traffic violence that we're, crisis we're facing here in the United States. Uh, Jesse is an expert on safe systems, injury prevention, harm reduction, and the ongoing rise in traffic fatalities, drug overdoses, falls, and other areas of injury-related death. Jesse's writing appears in outlets such as the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the Nation, Bloomberg, New York Magazine, The Guardian, and elsewhere. All, all the good outlets, I must add. Uh, Jesse studied journalism at the Ar Arthur L. Carter School of Journalism at New York University under the wing of the late investigative journalist, Wayne Barrett. And I'm now gonna turn it over to you, Jesse. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. So as Harv said, last year, I published a book about the word accident and how it's been used throughout history to obfuscate predictable and preventable tragedy. The impetus for the book was the current catastrophic rise in unintentional injury-related deaths. Today, more people die in so-called accidents than at any time in US history. These deaths include all the ways we die, short of disease and intentional violence. So drug overdoses and falls, drownings, fires, and what we're here to talk about today, traffic crashes. After decades of decline, so-called accidental deaths have been on the rise for the past 30 years. Traffic fatalities in specific have been rising for the past 10. So let's look at the numbers. 
42,939 people were killed in traffic crashes in the US in 2021. 2.5 million people were injured to the point of needing medical treatment. Now, we call these accidents, and I want to be very clear. The fact that we call these accidents is both categorically incorrect and very intentional. We call these accidents because automakers, traffic engineers, and police have primed us since the advent of the automobile to understand these as accidents. Let me explain. Accidents, by definition, are supposed to be random and unpredictable. But if that were true, traffic fatalities would fall randomly and unpredictably across time and across the population. But this is not what happens. Rather, like clockwork, traffic fatalities rise every year that our vehicles get larger and heavier, that our income inequality grows steeper, and that we further suburbanize our most impoverished populations. And like clockwork, the people most likely to be killed are always of the same economic and racial demographic and from the same places. For example, people living where some of you all are in Ohio are twice as likely to be killed in traffic than people where I live in New York. And across the board, Black people, Indigenous people, and people living in America's poorest states and counties are dramatically more likely to be killed in traffic crashes. So there's nothing random or unpredictable here. Black and Indigenous people are not more accident prone. Ohioans are not worse drivers than people living in New York State. Rather, some people are exposed to more dangerous conditions than others, which is to say that policy decisions and unregulated corporate power lead to risk unequally distributed across the U.S. We often think of traffic crashes after each one as like a matter of personal responsibility, of being an attentive driver, of looking both ways before you cross the street, of wearing a helmet. But traffic crashes are actually a matter of risk exposure. And as these statistics show, we are not all exposed to the same risks. And let me offer perhaps the simplest evidence that I'm right. While traffic fatalities are on the rise in the US, traffic fatalities are declining in our peer nations. And in general, people are killed in traffic at a far lower rate in our peer nations than here. So either you believe that we are fundamentally worse at driving, walking, and biking than people in Europe or Japan, or you believe that conditions are different here. What's more, traffic fatalities in this country fell for decades before starting their recent rise. So either you believe that we suddenly got worse at driving, walking, and biking, or you believe that the conditions change. Today, we're gonna to talk about why this is, why black people and indigenous people and people living in the poorest states and counties are more likely to be killed in traffic. And we're gonna talk about the reason that we often disregard these racialized and class-based deaths as accidents. And we're gonna talk about the history of how we got here, but I wanna start with a look in the mirror. Before we can understand how powerful people have weaponized the idea of the accident and the belief that traffic deaths are just random and free from bias, we need to understand why we fall for it. When we talk about traffic fatalities, what we're talking about is a racialized, class-divided public slaughter for the financial benefit of automakers, for the convenience of local governments, and disguised by the idea that people die on America's roads because they made an unintentional mistake. To truly understand this, we need a better grasp on two ideas, one that commonly draws our focus after a traffic fatality, and one that is commonly disregarded. We need to understand the difference between errors and conditions. So a human error is a mistake, and a dangerous condition is an environment. For example, to slip is a human error. Water left on the floor is a dangerous condition. To exceed the speed limit is a human error. A wide, straight road that induces high-speed driving is a dangerous condition. To jaywalk is a human error. But a bus stop without a crosswalk, that's a dangerous condition. When talking about is the difference between the way people behave and how the conditions surrounding their behavior affects what happens next. Now, to stick with the wet floor example, you can slip anywhere with or without water left on the floor. But in the dangerous environment of a wet floor, you're gonna fall harder and faster, you're less likely to be able to catch yourself, and you're more likely to get hurt. The same is true of the wide open road and the bus stop without a crosswalk. A driver can speed on any street, right? But on a wide street road, they're gonna go faster and they're gonna be less likely to be able to stop in time. Jaywalking can happen everywhere, but at a bus stop without a crosswalk, it is far more likely and far more likely to get you killed. Simply put, conditions induce behaviors, 
And it is harder to control the harm of our mistakes in the face of dangerous conditions. And what matters is the harm. But we rarely focus on conditions. Instead, we spend loads of energy focused on error, using education and penalization to try and correct the behaviors that people naturally tend towards, while disregarding the social and built environments to which people are exposed and which often influences their behavior. And this tendency is so pervasive, you might not even notice it. For example, if a floor is wet, we put out a sign that says wet floor instead of drying it. If speeding is a problem on a local road, you're more likely to see police officers patrolling than a redesign of the road that makes it more difficult and less likely that people will speed. If someone is killed jaywalking to a bus stop, we may test their corpse for drug and alcohol use before ever considering that we need to install a crosswalk everywhere that there is a bus stop because people need to cross the street where the bus stops. It's important to understand that there are two things going on here simultaneously. We focus on error in general as a human condition for reasons I'm about to explain. And powerful people, automakers, government officials, traffic engineers, police, have weaponized our tendency to focus on error to benefit themselves, whether that benefit is financial, social, or simply a justification of their role in society. First, let's talk about the human condition. Why are we so focused on human error? Because blaming human error is deeply comforting. If we decide that traffic crashes are people problems, then we get to think of each as an aberration and that the system, which we use every day to travel from place to place, as safe and sound. If the problem is people, and then the system is safe, and then we are safe, and our brains are always seeking safety. It's extremely important to understand these hardwired tendencies in ourselves so we can better understand how powerful people might weaponize them. So before we move on, I wanna do a quick dive into the psychology of human error. We are psychologically, evolutionarily primed to focus on human error when things go wrong. We've survived as a species because we are good at seeking out mistakes as a self-corrective measure. In the wilderness, we saw other people's failures and learned to survive. So if you notice someone was killed by a tiger while hunting in tall brush, you learn to be more cautious while hunting in tall brush and your genes live to tell the tale. So psychologists call this hyper-awareness of error and this hyper-awareness of error and behavior, especially when it comes to other people's injuries, the fundamental attribution error. This is a key concept. The fundamental attribution error is the near universal tendency to see your own mistakes as a product of the environment you were in at the time and to see other people's mistakes as a problem of human error, failure, and personal responsibility. It's called the fundamental attribution error because we attribute it wrong fundamentally, even in the face of evidence to the contrary. When we screw up while walking, biking, or driving, we blame the conditions that we faced. But when other people screw up, we blame their character, who they are as people. At their core, these are comforting questions, not because they solve problems or prevent the same traffic crashes from happening again and again. Essentially, what this does is just make us feel better because it separates us from disaster and tragedy. When we ask, what did person X do wrong while walking, biking, or driving, and we produce an answer, then we're able to draw a line in the sand between ourselves and terrible outcomes. This process of deciding who did what wrong is a way of telling a bad person's story. And this is another key concept known as the just world fallacy. It is the simple and totally false belief that the world is just that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. It's sort of a way of reasoning backwards. We look at a traffic crash and we think, bet they did something to deserve this. And that is super comforting because if you decide that the crash was caused by person X doing something wrong and thus that person X is bad, then you've also decided that you are not that, that you are good, that you would make better decisions under the same circumstances. It's a way of saying it couldn't happen to me so let's talk about what results from these psychological hangers. Now, imagine a person is struck while jaywalking to a bus stop where there is no crosswalk. If what happens next is that the government official in charge of that street to comfort themselves decides that what happened first was that a bad person jaywalked, then the bus stop without a crosswalk remains. And based on these psychological hangups and the fact that the people who are most likely to be killed and injured are also most likely to be the least powerful people in our society, then it's pretty clear to see how we all might have a subtle, unspoken, perhaps unrecognized belief 
that the dead might have deserved their fate, and thus that no systemic structural change is warranted. Focusing on what happened first, identifying that human error is at best an inconsequential and largely ineffective answer to the problem. At worst, it actually sets the stage for the same traffic crashes to happen again and again. And these tendencies, our biases and psychological hangups are taken advantage of. Remember earlier, I said that there were two things going on here simultaneously. We focus on error in general as a human condition. And for generations, powerful people have weaponized our tendency to focus on error to benefit themselves. Now, we can see this every day, like when a city's Department of Transportation spends millions on PSAs and billboard campaigns. This tells a story that benefits traffic engineers and government officials alike, because it says that the problem is, it's not, is people not following the rules. And that implies that traffic deaths are not the fault of engineers who design unsafe streets for high car throughput and for no one else. Or when a police department tickets drivers speeding on a highway. This tells a story that benefits police by justifying their existence. There are so many speeders, this says. We need police to catch them. But the truth is that we have reams of evidence as to what reduces speeding. And it's not police chasing a few drivers for going 120 miles an hour. It's speed governed vehicles and narrowed roads that make drivers feel unsafe speeding. Government officials and politicians also benefit from the tendency to focus on error because it's cheaper to respond to a spike in traffic crashes if you understand it as a behavioral problem than if you understand it as a systemically dangerous condition, right? A billboard campaign is cheaper than redesigning a road. Police enforcement is already built into the budget. Blaming people is cheaper and easier than questioning the underlying system. Now, if you're thinking, Jesse, be serious. The problem here is bad behavior. Drivers are making dangerous decisions. Then let me give you just one quick example. There's a million like this, but because I like this quote, let's look at Finland. The average lane width in Finland is around two feet narrower than the US. So when you leave here, if you get in a car, try to imagine that your lane was two feet less wide. Imagine how that would make you drive. Between 2012 and 2021, traffic fatalities fell by 26% in Finland. In that same period, traffic fatalities in the US rose by 29%. Finland designs its roads to reduce the likelihood of a high speed fatal crash by making drivers feel unsafe speeding. They control the conditions to control the outcomes and the likelihood of error. In the US, we design our roads to encourage high speed travel by building wide straight roads with high speed limits. And then we post up billboards telling people to slow down and ticket them when they don't. We focus on the error. Now, I've talked a lot about how we benefit psychologically from, pret from pretending traffic crashes are a matter of human error and how locally in any given community, powerful people in the local government might benefit. But on a much, much larger scale, it also benefits automakers when we tell a story that traffic crashes are caused by human error. There's a long history of automakers weaponizing our tendency to focus on error to sell cars. To understand this, I'd like to look at one particular type of crash when a jaywalking pedestrian is killed by a driver. I wanna tell you how jaywalking came to be invented. To tell this story, you need to imagine what cities looked like before cars. Before the popularization of the automobile, streets and cities were playgrounds and open air marketplaces because transportation was walking and all of the transportation moved pretty slow and took a backseat to people. People ruled the streets. But for cars to succeed as a product, this needed to change. Cars needed to rule the roads, and automakers knew this. This was a pressing problem for automakers because as cars became more popular, the question of who ruled the street was especially contentious. Cars were becoming more affordable and available. Traffic fatalities were skyrocketing, and people were starting to protest. And those protests focused on the idea that cars themselves were inherently dangerous and that we needed to pass laws limiting the speed of cars and their access to cities. This, of course, would be wildly dangerous to automakers' ability to sell cars. So to counteract the bad press and any inkling that laws and regulations should limit automobile access, automakers set up a number of boogeymen to blame, and one of them was the jaywalker. So jaywalker is actually a portmanteau. Uh, jay is an old word for hillbilly. Uh, so a jaywalker was a country bumpkin who didn't know how to operate on city streets. Before the 1920s, there was no such thing as a jaywalker. People who walked in the streets were just people. And today, jaywalking is illegal in every state. So this transformation took a concerted effort by automakers. Um, and if you're looking to read about it, um, Peter Norton's excellent book, Fighting Traffic, tracks this story. 
So since cars were new and pedestrians had long rolled city streets, someone had to invent the idea that a person could even walk improperly. And automakers did just that. They bought newspaper ads so Jaywalker would appear in the press. They created news services that cataloged traffic crashes, providing free information to the press while always finding the Jaywalker at fault. They even bought traffic signs for cities that read Jaywalking Prohibited, even though it wasn't a law yet. So the Jaywalker was a way for automakers to tell a story that people weren't dying in car crashes because cars were inherently dangerous, but because people were accident-prone jaywalkers. Now, obviously this was massively successful. Today, we all think jaywalking is wrong and bad. And if you get hit by a car in the street, it's the fault of the jaywalker, not the fact that cars are dangerous machines to have in places where people walk. It's a great example of how intoxicating it can be to blame human error and how easily we can be distracted from inherently dangerous conditions and how drawing focus to human error can serve private interests. Now, the jaywalker is a propagandistic archetype, a way to say that accidents are caused by accident-prone people, distracted people bad people making bad mistakes and decisions, and that the fault does not lie with the system in which those people operate. It's a way to say that the system is perfectly fine, if not for all these imperfect people. So what happens when we apply this old story to the current state of our streets? There we can see the insidious results of blaming human error and the so-called jaywalk. Indigenous people today, are five times more likely than white people to be struck and killed by walking. Black people are more than twice as likely for each mile walk to be struck and killed as white pedestrians. For Latino people, the pedestrian fatality rate is 1.5 times as high as a white person walking. For, now, Black people, Indigenous people, and Latino people are not uniquely prone to jaywalking. These people are exposed to more dangerous conditions. For example, pedestrians are more likely to be killed on wide, high traffic streets without sidewalks and crosswalks and streets with limited lighting, which is to say poorly maintained roads in poor neighborhoods, in poor counties, in poor states. People die walking most of all in places with no investment in even the most basic traffic safety measures. And there is, of course, a correlation between race, class, and the neighborhoods which receive the least investment. And this danger is built into the very design of where people live. This happens today, and this started 100 years ago. For example, redlining in the 1930s and 40s undermined Black home ownership. And this empowered the racist builders of America's early highways to build those roads straight through Black neighborhoods. So then the highways were a segregationist tool. But today, Black people are still more likely to live near a highway as a result. Now, those historic policies cause traffic deaths now because living near highways delivers more drivers traveling at highway speeds to residential streets. And people who live near highways are more likely to be killed in a car crash. One study found that formerly redlined neighborhoods, those graded D for lending risk by the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation, and more than double the pedestrian fatality rate as neighborhoods graded A. Researchers even found that any given urban or suburban rail project is more likely to not get built more likely than not to get built if it'll serve white people, and more likely than not to get canceled if it'll serve people of color. And this affects the likelihood of dying in traffic because the per mile fatal risk of rail travel is more than 20 times lower than driving. So decades after the decision to build or not build a train, people of color are more likely to lack an alternative to driving, walking, or biking on unsafe roads and suffer the crashes that result. So in these ways, policies of economic and racial segregation in one generation can lead to traffic deaths in many generations down the line. And today we're seeing new and novel economic and racial divides that are adding to the toll. For example, today the US is undergoing a trend of vehicle bloat. New cars are more likely than, are more likely to be SUVs and trucks than sedans. And those SUVs and trucks that we're more likely to have access to have a larger footprint, higher front hoods and a heavier curb weight than ever before. So we're in this sort of vehicular arms race where these larger than ever new vehicles are far more likely to kill people outside the car, but also people in smaller, older vehicles. And the people most likely to drive SUVs and trucks are white and wealthy. And the people most likely to drive older, smaller, smaller cars are poor and not white. So this is also systemic. So separated from error and personal responsibility that you can map it. So this is what's known as the car death bill two horizontal stretches across the deep south and the Great Plains that see the highest rate of road fatalities in the country. 
The car death belt tracks with poverty, GDP, income, even the number of college graduates in the state. But if we ask the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which controls vehicle regulations, um, or even departments of transportation around the country, what is to be done about the rise in traffic fatalities in these places? Well, they can and do offer this. Drivers need to slow down. Pedestrians need to wear bright colors. Safety is a shared responsibility. Everyone needs to follow the rules of the road. Now, this is just the government leaning on our psychological hangups to pass the buck. The truth is that the condition of our roads and vehicles are explicitly stacked against certain people's survival. And the people in charge of those conditions, the only people who could change those conditions, insist that the problem is all of us. Now, I'd like to tell you uh, one last story before I go, before we take questions. Um, it's from Marietta, Georgia. So in the spring of 2010, a black woman named Raquel Nelson got off a bus that stops directly in front of her apartment building with her three children. And she stood waiting to cross the four lane highway that stood between her and her home. Nelson's a single mom. She moved her family around by bus, like most of the people in her apartment building, because she couldn't afford a car. Now, even though there was an apartment building on one side of the street and a bus stop on the other, the nearest crosswalk to Nelson's home was a 20 minute walk up and back down the other side of the street. Like most people in her apartment building, Nelson walked her kids across the busy street instead of going 20 minutes out of her way. But this time on April 10th, 2020, it was dark because the family had missed a prior bus and her four-year-old was carrying a goldfish in a plastic bag. There were a lot of reasons to not go out of their way. When they ran across the street, a white man named Jerry Guy ran over one of Nelson's children with his van and fled the scene. Nelson's four-year-old child, AJ, died from his injuries. Jerry Guy was partially blind, admitted to taking pain medication that day, and had previously been convicted of two different hit and runs. Police eventually caught Jerry Guy and charged him with the hit and run, cruelty to children, and vehicular homicide. In time, a judge dropped all the charges but the hit and run. He was sentenced to two years in prison and ended up serving six months. But a judge also charged Raquel Nelson in her son's death with reckless conduct, with crossing the street somewhere other than a crosswalk, and shockingly, somehow, with vehicular homicide. There is no homicide level crime for being a pedestrian, but the urge to blame Nelson was so powerful that the charge for killing someone with your car was applied. An all white jury convicted Nelson, a black woman, on the last charge. She faced up to three years in prison until her case attracted national media attention and a judge offered her a retrial. She ended up with a year's probation and 40 hours of community service for the crime of someone else killing her child. She would likely need to run across the four lane highway where her son died to reach the bus to attend that community service. Now, I wanted to tell you this story because I suspect you will feel angry at the driver who, excuse my language, was a real piece of shit. And the judge in the case as well, who was also a real piece of shit. But perhaps you're even angry at Raquel Nelson who was totally innocent, but you do you. And I wanna tell you that this anger is the wrong place to focus your energy. As we challenge the racist and classist laws and planning policies that created the current deeply divided state of risk on our roads, we need to train our focus at a higher level than individual pieces of shit. If we decide that the problem in this case is the reckless driver or even the problematic judge, or God forbid, the innocent mother, we let the traffic engineers and planners and lawmakers off the hook. Blaming any of these parties does little to prevent the crash from happening again, because the blame fails to address the dangerous conditions that produced this crash, namely the absence of a crosswalk and an intersection that people need to navigate if they ride the bus. Raquel Nelson lived in a suburb built for people with cars, but she couldn't afford one. There was a bus stop, but no crosswalk. There was an apartment building and an intersection, but no traffic light. There was a four lane highway, but no easy way across. Now, this is a systemic condition. As many as, as many as one in every four times a pedestrian is hit by a driver in the Atlanta, Georgia area, the crash occurs within 100 feet of a bus stop. Expand the radius to within 300 feet of a bus stop, and you've accounted for nearly half of pedestrian crashes. But Georgia and Atlanta are included in the sorry, both Georgia and Atlanta are included in the state and city lists of the top 20 most dangerous places in the US for pedestrians, year after year. Now, 
After the crash, a team from Atlanta Traffic Operations went to the site to investigate. And that investigation consisted of counting the number of pedestrians, such as Nelson and her neighbors, who needed to run across the street. They decided that they would not install a crosswalk for Nelson and her neighbors. In doing so, they were acting on the guidance of Federal Traffic Safety Manual, which says that unless 100 people are risking their lives running across the street every hour for four hours, or five people, such as Nelson's child, are being hit by cars in a year, then it's not warranted to install a traffic signal on a crosswalk. Another way to understand this is that solving the problem, installing a crosswalk, would be tantamount to admitting that there was a problem with the conditions on the road, that cars were dangerous, that the streets were dangerous, that people, even jaywalking people, even people who ride the bus had a right to the road. But blaming the driver or the mother who lost a child made all that disappear. It made it about the errors. Fixing the problem means there is a problem. Blaming someone means there's no problem at all. Raquel Nelson story is the end result of a long line of work by automakers and traffic engineers and government officials to train our focus away from the inherent danger of cars and traffic into the idea that personal responsibility will somehow save us all. The jaywalker is an old idea, but today these old ideas have been weaponized to explain away the deaths of people who have the least power to defend themselves. And we fall for it, perhaps because we are biased against these people too. Look, if you drive an old car, you're more likely to be struck and killed by the driver of a new car because automakers have been pushing larger and heavier vehicles onto the market for the past decade because they can charge more for them with predictably deadly results. If you don't own a car, if you walk or bike or take the bus, you are more likely to be struck and killed by a driver because the government does not design roads for you, only for cars, even though you have no choice but to use those roads. And because it's cheaper and easier, because we are psychologically primed to do so, and because automakers and police officers and traffic engineers and your local, elect local elected officials so readily push the idea, you're more likely to think that all these deaths are not the systemic result of structural inequity, but 40,000 people a year dying because they made unique individual mistakes and bad decisions, ones that you would have made differently if you were in their shoes. Until we, until we start to resist that crutch of blaming human error, we will keep losing this fight and keep losing our neighbors. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Jesse Singer. I'm the author of a book called There Are No Accidents, and it was a pleasure to talk to you all today. I will take some questions now. Okay, thank you, Jesse. That's the kind of straightforward kind of approach that uh, makes your book so powerful. So um I'd like to jump into some questions here and, and I'm gonna encourage people in the audience to also uh, submit submit questions. And we already have some queued up, but I think I'll start with just a few. Let's start with Vision Zero. You know, Vision Zero efforts are very popular. We have one here in Columbus. I know you probably don't know much about what's, what's going on here. And I wouldn't, wouldn't ask you to comment on that, but I do want you to comment on um, the intention of Vision Zero and how it's implemented. You know, Vision Zero, as envisioned in Sweden, was an attempt to shift the responsibility away from blaming individuals and instead um, shifting responsibility to government officials and traffic engineers who created the conditions that lead to high rates of deaths on roads. But it doesn't seem to be making as much progress here in the United States. I'm wondering if you could comment on what you know about Vision Zero efforts in the U.S. and where they're failing. Yeah, uh, I live in one of the places where they're failing um, here in New York City. Um, we're going backwards. Traffic fatalities continue to rise. Um, and there are a lot of things going on here, but I think it's important to specifically talk about the vision zero part, what's failing about implementation. Um, and that is in the US, by and large, outside of a few exceptions, vision zero is a marketing slope. Um, essentially, it was a new logo and name for what traffic uh, safety has always been predicated on the U.S., which is the three E's, education, enforcement, and engineering. Um, now, two of those three E's are human error responses. Education and enforcement essentially say the problem here is that people don't know enough, or the problem here is that people behave. And then one of those things, engineering, is about changing the conditions that people operate on. Um, so essentially, in the U.S., all we did was rebrand the three E's, call it a different thing, and keep doing everything else the same. Um, this fails to be what they called in Sweden and in places that have seen success with Vision Zero, a safe systems approach. Now, a safe systems approach puts aside education and enforcement and instead builds a system um, that assumes people are fools and makes it foolproof in that sense. 
it assumes mistakes, it assumes errors. And instead of trying to correct errors or perfect people, it cushions the blow of those mistakes. It reduces the kinetic speed, for example, that any crash could occur at. So that when someone does make a mistake, when they're not paying attention, when they're not looking where they're going, when they screw up, it's less likely to be deadly. It's about reducing impact, um, potential harm, making the whole system safer so that people can make mistakes. And part of that accepts that people are gonna make mistakes. We are gonna be dumb. We are gonna be not paying attention. We are gonna be distracted. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. And I think fundamental to the US just rebranding Vision Zero is the idea that we refuse to give up the idea that one can have three priorities. In Sweden and in other European countries that have succeeded with Vision Zero, they said, you know what? We have one priority and that's saving lives. But in the US, roads are designed with three priorities. No one dies, no one is late to work, and none of it costs too much. And as long as we keep those last two priorities, you know, as part of our basic design elements of every road, people are gonna to continue to die because you can't have three priorities. There's no such thing as three priorities. So looking specifically at the implementation, implementation of Vision Zero, that's really where I always see the failure. Um, I think one smaller element of that, which we probably will get to and probably applies in lots of places, is when we do make a safe systems approach street, we just do it on one street, you know? We see a place where a fatal crash occurred and we fix that one street, and then the, the street next to it and the street next to it and the street next to it that are the exact same design, we don't do anything on those. Um, and so I think a core element of Vision Zero as it was envisioned in Sweden was if a four lane road kills you, then every four lane road is suspect because it's understood that the design conditions are what is begetting the deadly behaviors. Right, I noticed that a lot of Vision Zero efforts focus on the high injury network in the city, when in fact, those are just where they happen to be concentrated when the same road designs exist in other places. And, um, you know, we may just be shifting the um, the pattern, basically. Um, you mentioned about foolproof systems, and that, that reminds me of um, a quote you had in your book. Sooner or later in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs, which I think is true. So given this, what do you think about like autonomous vehicles if, if they ever happen? You think that's going to solve our problem or or just open up another can of worms? I love talking about this. Uh, one, I don't think it's ever going to happen. Um, uh, I think we've been we've we've heard a decade of promises about how the tech was going to get here, I think, last year. Um, and it's nowhere near there. But even putting that aside, I think. Um, autonomous vehicles are a really interesting thing. And again, we all fell for it for a really specific reason. Autonomous vehicles were sold, advertised as a cure for the nut behind the wheel. They were sold on a human error premise that the cause of traffic fatalities, the reason we die in traffic fatalities is not that cars are inherently dangerous or that streets are designed in an inherently way that, you know, a way that is inherently dangerous and produces constant conflict, but that the problem was us drivers who were nuts, it was human error, it was driver error. And they all, all the AI companies were like, driver error is the cause of 96% of traffic crashes. So we need autonomous vehicles. Um, and we fell for it because of all these psychological hangups that I've talked about, you know, that we do want to blame the people who, you know, have made the mistake were closest to the disaster. Of course, this isn't true. The dangerous conditions of our roads will remain the same. And we see in all these places that are actually testing out autonomous vehicles, a rather high rate of um, you know, dangerous crashes, whether it's the failures of Elon Musk's Tesla systems, um, you know, striking pedestrians, or the recent data out of San Francisco's test with the cruise auto um, autonomous taxis. You know, and you know, this is just another example of automakers selling us the idea that the problem isn't cars, that the problem is people. And this time robot people will solve it. Um, so I feel like this is not only not going to work, even if the technology ever got there, it um, just continues on the same path of believing that the problem isn't the system we've set up, but a few people who suck at driving. And speaking of automobiles, you do mention, you know, the larger size of vehicles, how fast they can go, you know, at speeds that greatly exceed, uh, you know, legal limits in the United States. They're designed to go to break the law, essentially. And, um, you know, higher uh, front ends that can hit you higher up in your body and cause more damage. But automobiles today are, are designed with lots of safety features, seat belts, airbags, crush zones, dashboard designs that protect people inside the vehicle. What would you change to, to protect people outside the vehicle when it comes to automobiles? 
I mean, what safety features would you like to see? Yeah, this is huge. And, and this is interesting. I was talking about how traffic fatalities fell in this country for decades and have been rising for the last 10 years. Much of that fall can be attributed to when we started regulating safety features into vehicles, when we made seatbelts and airbags and soft dashboards and crush zones mandatory. Um, and what we did in that was we made things a lot safer for drivers. And now they're getting less safe for drivers. We can talk about that too, but they're also getting much less safe for pedestrians. Um, so basic technology, um, you know, some of the stuff is stuff that we could easily, and I want to, I want to call out Pete Buttigieg here, who has totally failed as the leader of the US DOT to take up the potential regulatory mandate of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. NHTSA should be passing so many regulations that we're not. Um, and there's some really basic stuff, automatic emergency braking. Um, and pedestrian detection, which to their credit, they just started the regulatory process on, but also driver alcohol detection systems. There's now amazing tech that can tell whether the driver is drunk without a breathalyzer. Um, pedestrian section, um, something we have in Europe and Japan, outer airbags, so airbags that um, cushion the front of the vehicle. Um, and then there's other stuff that I think we are too cowardly in this country to take on, but that is the reason that traffic fatalities are declining in our peer countries. Vehicles that are smaller, that are lighter, and that are speed governed with intelligent speed assist. We do those three things. We save tens of thousands of lives automatically. And I want to ask one more question before I turn it over to Jerrica to get some audience questions. But this is one I'm biased because I'm a geographer and I do, um, and do GIS and mapping. But in your book, you talk about some of the efforts to map traffic violence. For example, you tell the story in the 1920s how the City Club of New York mapped children killed by automobiles in Manhattan, and they called it the Municipal Burnt Murder Map Project to show you a way different mindset back then. And you also mentioned the work of geographer uh, Bill Bungie, William Bungie, and his maps of Detroit with provocative titles such as where white commuters are are, are running over black children. So, um, you know, there was this was powerful attempts to use the patterns that we see, the spatial patterns we see in crashes to convince people that there are no accidents. There's something going on here. In our own work, and I want to put a link for the audience in the in the um, in the chat there. That's a work that was done by Dr. Th Dr. Jonathan Stiles, who used to be a postdoc in Cura, now is at Columbia University. And if you look at some of the maps of those cities, you see clear systematic patterns that vary by neighborhood and vary by infrastructure. So I, I guess I would like to hear some of your advice for the geographers, the mappers, the GIS people out, out there in the audience who are working on this topic. Um, how do we convey this information in a powerful and actionable way? I mean, the pattern seemed clear to me, but how do we convince people through through this powerful technology that there's something going on here? I'm also gonna share a link to um, a mapping project I worked on. Oh, that's not a good link. You can copy and paste it, but um, mm -hmm. Spatial Equity NYC uh, here in New York um, that I worked on with transportation alternatives. And I think, you know, the reason I called out um, you, the maps that you said in the book, and this really would be my advice for folks, um, is that I called out these maps in particular because they're not neutral. And I often find, you know, with GIS folks, with folks who are with geographers and mapping, that maps are too neutral. Um, they often seem to say, look at all this bad stuff without a why and a what to do about it. We think that the data is so powerful, that the map is so powerful, that the representation of the bad is so powerful, that it will do the work for us of trying to change it. And I think that that's kind of, um, that's a big gap that like the data isn't enough. We are constantly overwhelmed with how horrible the world is. We can see that every day in a million different ways. And so the fact that it's in a map might point out the ways that it appears systemic. But I think for people who don't live in the world of maps, we really need to connect the dots. And so like where commuters run over black children is one hell of a title and a lot more powerful title than racial inequities in pedestrian fatalities in the Detroit area. And, you know, what was happening there was a, a refusal to say that anything of this is neutral. Um, and, you know, in the, in the detail on that map, he talks about why. He talks about old road design that, that weren't changed because of racism. Um, you know, I think, I think it requires a little bravery, um, which, you know, maybe um, you know, and a little political directness, which is a little outside the world of like data folks. Um, but I really do think it's worthwhile pointing out like explicitly what this map says 
how it got that way and what it will take to change it. Um, because like even your elected officials, and this was something we tried to do with this um, mapping project I just shared, Spatial Equity NYC, was to present solutions to those elected officials, but also make those elected officials see by ranking. We like ranked every city council district, for example, on traffic fatalities and vehicle speeds and air pollution. So that you saw like you were the 51st worst traffic you know, district in the city. Um, and that really gave you an impetus to fight for something better like your neighbor and community had. Great, great answer. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn over to Jerrica now. We have a ton of questions. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> please go ahead, Jerrica. So I'll start off with this first question that says, OSU campus is so sprawling that there are many points where student pedestrians nece uh, necessarily interact with car traffic, but in particular, High Street always feels dangerous to maneuver either as a pedestrian or a driver. How might a large student body be mobilized to see themselves as acti active participants in their community um, and infrastructural organization? And how can we encourage otherwise temporary residents, many moving elsewhere after graduation, to see them uh, see themselves um, and input uh, well-being as equal to long-term residents? That's a that's a extremely uh, tricky, especially that last part is like a really a, a tricky thing that you're trying to solve. Um, but I think something that happens and like I wonder if I could like help you take a step away from the like temporariness and more the thing that happens when you are a pedestrian, which is that you you already know that you're you're powerless, right? You know that that it's on you, that your safety is your caution. Same thing with cyclists that like that you are at risk and that the roads aren't built for you. Um, and so I would wonder if there's something to be done around organizing people around that identity of a person who walks in a way that is social and fun and like appeals to, you know, people who are in college. Um, critical mass rides are something that I always believed in. Um, you know, critical mass is last Friday of every month, all the cyclists meet at this spot and we're all going to ride together. And when we all ride together, suddenly we're powerful. We're as powerful as the cars. We're more powerful than the cars. The cars have to wait for us. Um, and what's good about it is it's social and fun, but it also shifts your perspective on your rights and what you deserve and how your power is maintained on the road. And I wonder if there's something to do with that in the same as pedestrians, um, where you're making a social environment around maintaining space collectively and you know, demanding it where you can. But I do want to acknowledge that's a challenge. Thank you. Um, so our next question I'm going to ask um, is, uh, I'm interested to know if your studies included the growth population. An example, the aging of Gen X and Gen Z, which rapidly added drivers to the roads. Is there a correlation between the recent growth in accident numbers and um, addition of licensed drivers on the road? Likewise, uh, newer cars are more electronically aware of driving conditions, which reduces the need for driver to pay attention and to be more personally aware of their conditions. Generally, road conditions don't change much in urban and stable suburban areas. So an, uh, so an increase in accidents would lean towards human error, which includes a poorly maintained audible bill uh, human error in, uh, induced condition um, and a psychological issue and a sheer volume issue. So a, a, a large question, but however you would like to answer that. Yeah, I mean, um, so all of the, the recent increases in traffic fatalities are uh, a matter of, um, they're, they're, they're increasing in rate and number. So it's, it's, a, it's a per capita um, issue. Um, so it's not necessarily like a, a growth in the number of licensed drivers on the road. Um, and while newer cars are, some newer cars are more electronically aware of driving conditions, this is a sheer minority of cars on the road. Uh, first of all, it's not regulated, these technologies like uh, electronic lane assist. Um, so every car does, every new car does not have them. You have to pay extra for it. Um, but even if you do have it, cars on the road, and this is where I get at, and you know, you said that um, the, the questioner said that a poorly maintained automobile is a human error induced condition. And I would argue that that is not true. Um, wealth inequality is increasing. 
wages are stagnated, poverty is increasing, the average age of a car on the road is getting older. And that's because the cars last a little longer, but it also means that the average likelihood of a car on the road to have advanced safety features is less and less likely. And so what we're seeing is an increase in people dying in their cars um, in this sort of arms race where they drive a small car that's older or cheaper, you know, a Kia, um, and they are being killed by a larger, more expensive car. Um, and so we're seeing this strict economic stratification. And so while I would love if everyone had the safest car on the road, we have to recognize until NHTSA is willing to be brave enough to do the regulatory work that is their charge, then that will always be a matter of economic conditions and of economic disparities that divide all of the drivers on the road. Thank you. And I see a, a really cool question. Um, one is asking, um, I was wondering if you could talk about the role of automated enforcement in reducing traffic fatalities. There are data, um, there's data that suggests well-implemented programs do in fact change behaviors and the traffic fatalities decrease along with the treatment um, of corridors. While fines uh, can and should be used for design changes uh, that reduce dangerous conditions. So your opinion about automated uh, enforcement and fines. I love this question. I appreciate this question because I feel mixed about automated enforcement. All right, so here's the truth. Autom Police enforcement does not work very well to reduce traffic fatalities. Automated enforcement done right is extremely effective. Um, it does not have to have a big fine. Um, New York City's probably got the most effective speed camera program in the country. The fine is $50 um, for this to work. The difference, the reason police enforcement doesn't work, automated enforcement does work, is guarantee of punishment. Now, even the Department of Justice will tell you that level of punishment, the, the degree of punishment does not matter in recidivism. The thing that matters is the guarantee of punishment. If you guarantee people are going to get caught, they're much less likely to do something. Um, so this is what I feel tricky about. Automated enforcement works. But if we know our streets are designed to induce errors, and that we know this across the board, then we are catching people in a trap with some of our automated enforcement, right? If a, if a road is designed to encourage speeding and there's a speed camera on it, um, now that speed camera may reduce the likelihood of traffic fatalities, reduce speeding, but also it induces speeding. And so something I like to talk about with automated enforcement is that the, the fines should be income graduated. The fines should be forced to go directly to the road on which the traffic uh, violation occurred into redesigning that road. But also that these camera systems should be time limited and that departments of transportation should be on the hook if summonses do not reduce over time. So if you put a speed camera on a road and one year later, that speed camera is issuing the same number of speeding tickets, then that's the fault of the Department of Transportation who has created a road that induces speeding and failed to correct it. Um, so we need to create systems that force penalize the traffic engineers um, so that when automated enforcement is not reducing violations over time, those departments are on the hook for failing to design safe roads. Perfect. Um, so we probably have enough time for only about two more questions. Um, the next question I'm going to ask is, you touched heavily on racial inequities. Can you touch a little on gender inequities and pedestrian injuries and fatalities? That's a great question that I don't know offhand. Um, I am not certain that the numbers are cut and dry, but I'm going to go look them up as soon as we get out of here. But I would I would say a few things. Um, uh, women are more likely to um, take public transportation um, and uh, travel at the most, um, travel in the middle of the day, which would expose them to more dangerous conditions. Um, though I would suspect men are more likely to travel late at night, which is a high point for pedestrian crashes. Um, so, it might actually equal out, um, but I think also one thing that um, might complicate it is, I, I would suspect men have a slightly higher uh, pedestrian fatality rate because of rates of traveling at night, uh, rates of traveling to work in impoverished places um, with contrast with people who, um, you know, but that doesn't include women who are more likely to take public transportation as caregivers. 
I'm, I've totally not answered your question. I've thought about it a lot out loud and I'm gonna go look it up when we get out of here. Thank you. Um, so next um, it asks, uh, you briefly touched on the MUTCD in your presentation, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, the reliance of traffic engineering in the community um, on the MUTCD and the, uh, the reluctance of the FHWA to make more meaningful changes there. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, I think we saw a really brave effort by a lot of like smart, well-minded traffic engineers in the recent years to try and reform the MUTCD. Um, and, you know, there was a lot, there was a lot of hope there, but um, I think I interviewed of any profession, the people I interviewed more for my book were traffic engineers, because I really wanted to understand why, if you know better, and you seem to sometimes know better, do you keep designing roads this way? And, you know, I heard it again and again, you know, these are the rules, these are the rules, liability, these are the rules. Um, and I think, you know, in truth, what we see is traffic engineers are protected by the MUTCD. They're protected from liability. They're protected from responsibility. And so, and when it comes down to it, the type of people who become, you know, this is an engineer said this, so I, please excuse my bias, but an engineer said, listen, people who become engineers are people who like rules. They like to follow the system. They like a structure. That's the whole point. And so until we change that structure, the way they did in Sweden, until we change the things that the MUTCD like writs into law that for a vehicle, you know, that vehicle throughput matters more than anything else, that the ability to cross the street always has to come second to vehicle throughput. Um, until we shift those ideas and say, the seat of responsibility has shifted from these individuals who might break the rules to traffic engineers, and the priority of these roads has become saving lives before cost, before getting to work everyone on time, until we shift those basic ideas as a country, then the MUTCD is just a book of excuses for continuing to do what we want to do. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. That's probably a good note to end on so we can finish right at, at one o'clock. Um, just a reminder to the audience that we have two more events coming up, Jesus Barreas and also Veronica Davis. So come to kira.osu.edu and sign up for our newsletter and Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and all those places. You don't want to miss any of the exciting events that are happening at your friendly neighborhood center for urban and regional analysis. Jerrica just turned her camera off, but I wanted to say, uh, have the Kira family all uh, join us and welcome in, uh, in saying goodbye to Jerrica. She's actually leaving Kira to work for the Ohio Railroad Commission to work on very important infrastructure projects that will improve safety at road crossings and rail crossings in Ohio. So in the future, when you don't get hit by a train, you'll have Jerrica to thank. So thank you, Jerrica, for your for your your impact on Kira and everyone else. Stay tuned. We will we'll continue moving on. Take okay, goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Jesse. Great talk. And everyone, in the meantime, be careful out there. Goodbye. Thank you so much for having me.